good evening everyone so today's topic is uh, flavors and fragrance i hope you have made uh, note of this uh, upcoming ff dates yeah so today's topic is uh, flavors and fragrance industry so it's a sub segment of a broader chemicals industry so currently uh, the global chemical industry size is close to 5.5 trillion dollars and uh, traditionally europe and us were the key chemical hubs globally together they have accounted around 50% of global chemical sales till 2008 however things have changed since 2008 great recession post 2008 if you see uh, developing countries have fared better than the developed ones and especially over the last decade uh, the core of the chemical industry has shifted from west to east uh, manufacturers in asian region especially china enjoy uh, low labor cost rising domestic demand and government subsidies so currently uh, the china's contribution to the global chemical industry is close to 45% uh, within this uh, specialty chemical industry is uh, close to 750 billion dollar so that's roughly 15% of the chemical industry size it has grown at a, a cjr of 7% India contributes around four percent to the global chemical industry. Uh, so within this uh, global flavors and fragrance industry is thirty point four billion dollar as on March twenty twenty four. The flavors and fragrance industry could be divided into two uh, flavors. Predominantly goes into food uh, and drinks segment and uh, fragrances. So forty three percent of the industry is uh, flavors, fifty three percent fragrance, and remaining four percent is uh, overlapping between the two segments. Uh, the industry refers to products involved in enhancing the taste and smell of uh, various consumer goods. Uh, these substances are commonly used in food and beverage. Uh, it could be cost cosmetics, personal care, uh, household cleaning, and other applications. Uh, these chemicals have usage in our household uh, items like uh, soap, uh, hand sanitizer, uh, detergent, uh, incense sticks, agarbattis, uh, cosmetics, and uh, food industry. And one of the biggest usage is uh, perfume industry. So the experts in uh, flavor industry, known as flavorists, uh, they classify flavors into three broader segments. uh the first one is savory uh so savory flavors are uh, used in snacks sausages and namkins uh the demand for this uh, flavor is influenced by consumer preference uh coming from packaged goods and ready to eat uh, products uh second flavor is fruity uh which is used in fru- fruit flavored drinks such as fruit juices and beverages and uh, the demand is driven by f&b industry which is food and beverage uh, the third category is uh, dairy flavors used in uh, milk yogurt cheese and other dairy products uh, the demand here is driven by health consciousness of customers so uh, spices and flavors have been used thousands of years all over the world uh, beginning when people use simple herbs or spices to flavor their foods Uh, today the flavor industry is comprised of hundreds of companies all over the world uh, it has come a long way from naturally available flavors to now synthetic uh, blend of flavors uh, it's very it's very rare to uh, find different flavors in a drink uh, probably the last drink that we had uh, we might not have identified the different flavors it had Uh, have you ever wondered you know uh, what do we get when we combine let's say different flavors like uh, strawberry uh, lemon raspberry uh, etc of course uh, unless you are a flavorist that is impossible to answer so flavors that may appear uh, to be very simple uh, let's say chocolate or a mint uh, are incredibly actually complex in their creations uh let's say uh, for example vanilla which is consistently one of the most common flavor used globally uh from classic desserts like ice cream to modern drink specialties from starbucks consumers rank vanilla at the 
top of the flavors but do we actually know how uh, vanilla originates so it originates from vanilla orchid which has got the main substance called vanillin from where the flavor originates so there are a lot of complexities involved when these companies blend different ingredients to come out with the final product yeah so scientists uh, refer to three categories uh, to describe uh, tasting abilities uh, super taster medium taster and non taster a non taster is someone who has uh, less uh, less taste perception than say a medium taster uh, who has an average ability to sense different flavors along this line super tasters are those who experience taste uh, with far greater intensity than most others the term was coined by psychologist uh, linda bartushuk and she found uh, the tongues of the more sensitive tasters were densely populated with papillae which is nothing but uh, uh, taste buds which are there on the surface of the tongue giving them a stronger ability to taste what others could not we all have noticed that when we have cold uh, the food doesn't taste proper and it's a common phenomena uh, the nose heavily contributes to the flavor experience according to dr gordon shepherd the tongue can only sense five to six different tastes at once however nose can literally smell thousands of different flavors uh, this flavor sensation is known as uh, neurogastronomy uh, which refers to the way the brain creates the sensation of flavor and taste uh, the dr shepherd further explains Uh, the experience of flavor engages the brain more than any other behavior uh, coming on to fragrance uh, fragrance of a perfume is described by the notes that it is made of so notes are a uh, type of scents uh, that can be sensed upon application of a perfume uh, these notes differ with respect to the time that they can uh, they can be sensed once applied so this can be divided into three parts a uh, head note which is also uh, referred to as top note heart note referred to as middle note and the base note so head note is the lightest note uh, which we recognize immediately once it is applied it has got a light molecular structure and the first to fade away so this would include very common flavors like citrus coming from lemon orange uh, this will have light fruit since they have a very uh, less longevity to stay and some herbs uh middle note or heart note uh, those are sense once the top note uh, evaporates uh, of course they will last uh, they will last longer than the top top note and has a strong influence on the base note uh, heart note would include rose lemon grass coriander and so on uh, base note uh, mingles with middle note to create full impact of the fragrance so it will leave a lasting impression base note includes sandalwood vanilla musk so today the 30 billion dollar flavor and fragrance industry is having equal dominance uh, between north america europe and asia close to 9 billion dollars each uh, however in terms of per capita europe leads uh, the geography followed by north america north america and asia traditionally the fragrance industry has dominated in europe for its culture of premium perfumes and flavors uh, major global companies which we'll look in uh, future slides are predominantly having presence in europe followed by north america so these are the major uh, global flavors and fragrance player uh, givardon is the largest uh, flavors and fragrance uh, player uh, it is it is based of switzerland so if you see the global uh, uh, flavors and fragrance market it is reasonably consolidated the top 5 players would constitute close to 60% and top 10 players would constitute around 80% of the market uh, these companies have established themselves as leaders in the global flavor and fragrance industry uh, they have extensive r&d capabilities uh, global presence and extensive product portfolio Uh, Givardon followed by IFF is the second largest player and the largest player in uh, North America. 
Ferromanic uh, has merged with uh, DSM and jointly uh, after combining they are at the second position followed by Symbarize and others. Uh, if we look at Indian market, again, this global companies dominate. Uh, top three being Jivadon, Fermanic, and IFF. Uh, SH Kelkar, uh, along with PV, have close to 12 to 13 percent market share. And those are the two leading companies having good presence in the flavors and fragrance industry. There are other listed companies also, but very small size. So we'll look at the value chain of uh, flavors and fragrance. So very broadly, uh, the flavors and uh, fragrance value chain has four key stakeholders, uh, raw material suppliers, base ingredient manufacturers, functional ingredient manufacturers, and the end consumer industries. The raw material suppliers would include uh, agri output providers, uh, pine tree being the main uh, raw material, as well as oil and gas companies, which provides petrochemicals, which serve as a key raw material for this uh, flavors and fragrance industry. Uh, the products uh, could be uh, classified into both synthetic and natural. Uh, synthetic are the ones derived from petrochemicals and the one from pine derivatives. Uh, natural raw materials are herbs, spices, mint, and some other natural products. Uh, base ingredient manufacturers uh, would include uh, manufacturers of basic and standardized ingredients. Uh, the synthetic would include aroma chemicals and ingredients for nutraceuticals. So base ingredient manufacturers offer uh, products with minimum differentiation and they will of course have limited pricing power as compared to the other stakeholders. Uh, the third category is formulators which is where uh, the flavors and fragrance uh, companies would fall into. And these are the players who offer value added products uh, based on the specific end usage. Uh, also, these companies have uh, patents. Uh, they specialize in IP protected uh, compositions with complex specifications. Their final goods are uh, fragrance blends, cosmetic actives and flavors and colors. The last, which is the end user industry, are predominantly our FMCG players and uh, perfume manufacturers. Those are B2C players offering final products to consumers like us at the retail level. Uh, along with this, they will have a focus on marketing and branding, uh, developing a distribution network and reach, which is a key factor. Uh, those final products where these chemicals go into would be FMCG products, processed foods, dairy products and perfumes. So those four key stakeholders we can divide between companies. Uh, the raw material suppliers uh, among the listed space would be predominantly petrochemicals provider like Reliance in India and other chemical providers, uh, Dow and Dewpoint. Uh, within the ingredients space, uh, there are not much listed companies, especially in India. Uh, PV is one who have a very small segment of ingredients and others are like Anthea, Eternist. They have a good sizable presence, but those are unlisted. Uh, in flavors and fragrance, uh, Oriental Aromatics, SH Kilker, Privy are the key players at a global level again. Uh, IFF, Jivadon, Simrise are the main players. And last, uh, food and beverage and cosmetics, uh, the common names of Dabur, Marico, PNG, and so on. Uh, so these are. Uh, key growth drivers for this industry, uh, mega trends supporting organic growth. So we will see in the latest slides, inorganic growth has been very abrupt in this industry. Uh, one event like COVID, which has uh, hand sanitizer as a new product, uh, has seen significant organic growth. But it is very difficult to uh, develop uh, final end uh, products in this space. Hence, inorganic is the go-to route for the key global companies. Uh, second is uh, high disposable income because the product that uh, this industry is used like perfumes, fragrances and so on will require customers to spend more. So as the economy's disposable income would rise, the demand for these chemicals would also increase. Uh, it's a consolidated industry. Uh, 
top four players constituting 47 uh, percent all these global companies have a uh, footprint across the world even if a company is originating from europe or uh, america they will have significant presence in asia uh, apart from this uh, they will have to handle a lot of complexities because uh, these are innovative companies what we saw and they need to pr develop products uh, again and again so they need a very strong r&d and also capacity to handle large amount of raw materials because small small ingredients is required to uh, arrive at the final blends this is a, a basic order flow uh, in this industry so just taking an example of let's say uh, there is a fmcg company which is which is planning to launch a product uh, it could be let's say a shampoo or a perfume so they will give a brief to these chemical players uh, they will give a fragrance brief to these companies it could be Privy, it could be uh, sh Kilker or uh, oriental so once they get a brief they will start the process to develop the required uh, fragrance mandate from the fmcg or the perfume uh, manufacturer so they will typically provide they, they will typically develop 10 to 100 versions uh, which will develop one required fragrance uh, various ratios are developed of different ingredients to develop different versions of a fragrance all versions are then sent to their internal team who will have an internal specialist to screen this uh, product this specialist will then shortlist the best version and send to the FMCG companies so these FMCG companies will be sending the mandate to multiple uh, chemical companies and once they get the final shortlist they will have a final uh, product selected for the launch till uh, FMCG product company uh, till FMCG player uh, confirms one final product the supply and ingredients are never changed in the entire cycle so there is a lot of stickiness uh, if the new product doesn't get launched uh, the existing relationship will continue consolidation in the industry so we saw uh, the top four players contributing almost 47 50 percent of the global revenues so once your product is approved by the vendor they will not easily change it because there is a high switching cost uh, the end product uh, would hardly cost two to three percent for the fmcg player so it does not make sense for them to uh, change the player for cost cutting because it hardly constitutes any cost for their final products uh, there's a high r d expenditure uh, not all small players will be able to incur uh, significant uh, R&D expenditure uh, year on year in discovering new formulations. Uh, SKUs, global companies have more than 5,000 molecules. Uh, we saw uh, Indian companies, they have a limited presence in the uh, global uh, channel and hence they have a very limited SKUs. Uh, another challenge is if you have a global uh, footprint, you will need consistent supply chains all across the world. And lastly, uh, regulatory approvals. So uh, if you are present in Europe, you will need to uh, reach uh, approval. If your product goes into pharmaceutical, you will need a FDA approval and so on. So it's very difficult for any new uh, entrant or even a smaller player to grow at large on an organic way. The manufacturing process. So uh, the process could be uh, natural or synthetic synthetic derived from petrochemicals and natural predominantly coming from pine tree uh, chemistry so one needs to extract penine uh, for manufacturing of these chemicals uh, coming from pine trees this could be done in two ways one is uh, tapping which is basically uh, tapping the trunk of the pine tree wood at the very base uh, this gives resins oleo resins which is then extracted uh, through a distillation process. Uh, for this process, you need to have significant tie-up with the pine tree uh, farmers to get these oleo resins. This process is called GTO, uh, gum turpentine oil. The second process is uh, when these pine trees are cut, uh, they are sold to uh, paper mills all across the world. Uh, through a craft pulping process, the wastages are then sent to these chemical companies to extract uh, the same penine. Uh, this process is called CST. Basically, uh, it's called crude sulfate turpentine, where you will be separating the sulfate from the process. 
uh, there are very few companies who are engaging in the CST route. Uh, although you need one-time heavy capex, uh, but this gives you uh, stickiness in the sense of uh, acquiring uh, pulp raw material from the paper mills. Uh, whereas GTO, uh, the pricing are very volatile and you don't get the uh, availability uh, on time. So very few companies are there. Uh, in India, there is only one company, uh, Previ, which is uh, uh, employed the CHT process. Apart from that, IFF, uh, Firmenich, are the two other companies which have uh, adopted the CHT route. So these are the few uh, global companies. Uh, Jevodon coming from Switzerland is the largest F&F &F player. They have uh, significant presence both in flavors and fragrance. Uh, IFF, at one point in time, it was the largest company. However, in recent years, they have struggled. Uh, the current market cap is around $27 billion. Uh, Simra is uh, coming from Germany. And DSM and Fermanag again coming from Switzerland. So largely, uh, Europe is the major hub of these companies. And there are other companies in top 10, which are again from Europe. So we look at uh, a brief history of these individual companies. So Givodon is a Swiss based company uh, with 250 years of history. And uh, it is present all across the globe, uh, predominantly in North America and Europe. Uh, it is present in flavors, fragrance and cosmetic ingredients. So ingredients is a very, very small part, largely it's flavors and fragrance. Uh, company has a long history of uh, innovating scents and tastes. So all these global companies are on the similar lines of uh, pesticides where the top four companies are innovators, uh, whereas the others are mostly following the copy uh, model. So they need high R&D and good scientists to develop new products. Uh, Geodon is present in uh, all over household products from drink uh, to daily meals, perfumes, cosmetics, etc. Uh, company have 12,000 different raw materials sourced from 120 countries from more than 17,000 suppliers. Uh, they have 5,000 active patents worldwide and more of more than 20% of sales have resulted from innovations developed over the last five years. So these companies keep uh, innovating on new products to stay ahead of the market. So this is the revenue breakup of uh, CY 2023. So almost it's equal, uh, taste and well-being being flavor segment, uh, fragrance and beauty is a predominantly fragrance segment. So it's 52 is to 48 and they have further divided uh, the revenue into sub-segments. So 37% of the uh, flavor segment coming from savory, 35% beverages and so on. Uh, this is their key markets. Apart from uh, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, India and China are their key markets where they have been witnessing growth 1.5x of the industry size. And they have separate plans for individually for India and China. How would they want to grow in these geographies? IFF. Uh, it's the second largest uh, uh, flavors and fragrance chemical company in the world and with more than 70% of sales coming from non-discretionary food and cosmetics and markets. In 2023, not a single customer accounted for more than 10% of sales. So it's very diversified. Uh, top 25 largest customers accounted for just 32% of sales. Uh, so this company operates in three verticals. So these are different namings, uh, like Jordan named things differently. Uh, they have rather than two segments distributed into three segments, scent, taste and nutrition ingredients, which are then further split into 11 business lines. So scent accounted for 36% of group sales, uh, contributing 42% of EBIT, uh, which targets the beauty industry. Taste generates 34% of sales, uh, contributing 49% of EBIT, targets food and beverage producers. Nutrition and ingredients generates 30% of group sales, and includes most of the fruitarum business. So this company has acquired Israel based uh, fruitarum company, which is a, again a top 10 company uh, in 2019. So 
so this is the revenue by uh, sales coming from different sub segments uh, consumer fragrance 20 percent fragrance ingredients eight percent labor compounds 15 percent labor ingredients 20 percent and so on so these are roughly the 11 segments that company track individually uh, for reporting purpose So what are the key uh, regulations that one needs to keep note of? Uh, so US is the largest export market for uh, Indian aroma chemical manufacturers. Uh, there are few chemicals which goes into the pharma products also for which you will have to comply with FDA. So in India, uh, PV has got uh, FDA approval for one of its plant. Uh, rest of the companies, uh, be it Oriental or SH Kilkar, they don't have any uh, FDA approved plants. Apart from FDA, you need to get approval for environmental and occupational safety health. Uh, particularly for uh, fragrance products not applied on the body, you need uh, approval from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. As far as Europe is concerned, uh, REACH uh, is the body which looks after the uh, regulatory approvals and it is one of the most comprehensive uh, regulatory frameworks uh, and several other countries have modeled their policies around it. For example, Turkey, uh, the regulatory body is KKDIK, but it is largely on the similar lines. So these stringent regulations present in the market have both good and bad effects for the industry participants. Uh, for the existing players, it will act as a barrier to entry. And also it will significantly increase operating cost for smaller players. So this is a sales trend of uh, large four global companies. Uh, so Givordon, if you see, uh, has almost doubled their sales in last eight years. Uh, IFF has seen uh, the sales were largely stable from 2016 to 2020. And post that, it has uh, doubled to $11.7 billion. That is because of the uh, significant acquisition they have done. Uh, Simra is uh, another company on the lines of Giordan has done pretty well and DSM and Fermanek both are a merged company and the sales have remained flat. So they have faced some uh, integration issues since. Uh, Giordan uh, gross margins are pretty healthy. Uh, they have remained above 40% for a very large period. Uh, Simra is again uh, Consistent, uh, about 35% for the last 7-8 years. Uh, DSM again have faced a lot of issues in the integration and have collapsed. Uh, IFF has been volatile, but uh, it, has, it has come down from its uh, previous highs. A similar trend on the EBITDA. Uh, Eastern uh, whereas DSM and IFF has been more volatile and coming down uh, from the historical averages. Uh, so if you look at the R&D expense, even if you go back from 2010 onwards, this has remained in a similar territory of about 5% for a very long period. As we have seen, these are innovator companies who will have to keep investing uh, in the R&D development, spending on scientists, developing new formulations. So it has been in the range of 5 to 8% for a very, very long period. Uh, even on the debt side, uh, all four global companies have decent debt. Uh, if you look at Jivadan also, uh, from 2017, it was around 0.25. It has almost come to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 levels. Uh, and this is similar trend for all the companies. Uh, the reason being, uh, you need to do a lot of inorganic acquisition to expand your product base, to expand your geography, because developing a new product every now and then is difficult for even the larger players. So, inorganic is the way to go. Uh, on the ROE side, uh, Givordon and Simrise seen, uh, have maintained their uh, ROE percentages, about 10%. For Givordon, it is about 20% for a very, very long period. Uh, in case of uh, IFF and uh, DSM, uh, but, you know, debt for 
we have done post 2019. So uh, that has impacted somewhere uh, both of these companies. So M and D have activity significantly increased, uh, especially in last uh, five years. Uh, smaller players uh, who have got strong competence, but in a single product, and they have a limited geography presence, are uh, getting acquired by the larger players since this player need more access to the broad market and they need a distribution facilities. So these are the few uh, domestic m and transactions. Uh, so bigger Indian companies are resorting to m and and a led growth to quickly ramp up uh, their scale, try and gain access to new products or geography or customers. Uh, so SS Scalecar uh, has done a few acquisitions in last 10 years. Although smaller in size, considering the size of Indian listed players here. And also uh, the below table shows some foreign acquisitions uh, in Indian companies. Uh, the more predominant one is Fairfax. Uh, they have uh, acquired 51% stake in uh, Preview Organics. However, they have exited in 2021 at a decent uh, gains. Uh, assets Kelka especially have been doing a lot of uh, inorganic acquisition even in the uh, recent five years and they have done some global acquisition also. So traditionally it was weaker in the flavor segment. It has made two acquisitions recently which has helped them to gain market share in the flavor segment. As Indian companies become bigger in size through inorganic growth, they are expected to attract strategic interest from global players to strengthen their presence. Uh, so this is an Israeli company which has been acquired by IFF uh, in 2019. So if you look at before uh, 2018, uh, they have done a lot of acquisitions. So IFF operates 37 manufacturing facilities. On top of that, they got additional uh, 54 uh, manufacturing units from Fruterome. So together they will be managing more than 90 units now. And just before uh, 2018, they have acquired 38 companies since 2010. So these are the few companies, few leading companies where they have done acquisitions. Uh, Fruterome is an uh, Israeli-based company who has done 38 acquisitions since 2010 before being acquired by IFF. So despite so many acquisitions, the company has struggled to do a decent growth and finally have to succumb to the uh, uh, merger and acquisition route. And post that also, uh, they are still struggling for last four or five years uh, in the integration issues. Similarly, uh, DSM, uh, which has also merged with uh, Fermenic, uh, they have also done 20 plus acquisitions since 2010 and uh, still they are going through uh, integration. We have yet to see any synergy benefits. So it's a very common phenomenon for these global companies to uh, either acquire companies or eventually get merged with some of the global players. And that's the reason being a uh, high consolidation in the sector. So these are the few listed players, Indian listed players in this space. Um, TV and SH Kilkar are almost uh, same size when it comes to revenue. Uh, Previ is the largest uh, chemical, uh, liver and fragrance chemical manufacturer and exporters of uh, aroma chemicals. Uh, they've got more than 20% market share in the top 10 products globally. SH is having a presence in both uh, flavors as well as fragrance, unlike Previ, which is only into fragrance. And uh, SH Kilkar has started. Uh, branding also in the name of SHK, Cobra and Keva for few of its uh, products. Uh, Oriental Aromatics have decent presence in the camphor business also uh, traditionally. Uh, and also they are increasing uh, their presence in aroma chemicals. Uh, Mangalam Organics, Kanchi Karpuram are two other players. Uh, but a very small size of roughly 500 crores uh, or below that. So these are the customer base for Indian listed players. So uh, not only they uh, sell goods to perfume manufacturer as well as FMCG, they will also be uh, selling products to their peers. So Preview would be some of the 
ingredients to Oriental or SHK and also to their global peers like Givaudan, Fermenic. So uh, it's very difficult uh, that you only depend on your end user industry, but you have to keep uh, tapping your peers also for uh, getting some revenue at a decent level. Uh, Oriental Aromatics, uh, so it's a f first company to set up synthetic uh, camphor plant in India. In 1964, uh, they borrowed the technology from uh, DuPont uh, USA. Uh, it's uh, one of the leading uh, players in the camphor market today and also with some presence in uh, trying to increase the presence in aromatic chemicals. Uh, in 2014, uh, they signed a supply agreement with IFF for supplying intermediates and finished products in the aroma chemicals. Uh, they have key clients like PNG, Johnson & Johnson, Novartis and so on. So Camphor, uh, which goes into Wix brand, PNG acquires 80% of their Camphor requirement from Oriental alone. However, in last two years, uh, Camphor prices have been very volatile and this has impacted uh, the financials of Oriental Aromatics. Uh, that's the risk of being uh, uh, sizable presence in the Camphor market, which is getting more and more uh, commodity in nature in the last few years. The key raw material is uh, Alpha Penine, uh, which has witnessed high price volatility in the past. Uh, the RM consumption accounts for almost 60% of uh, Oriental sales exposing its profitability to price fluctuation. SH Kilkar, uh, one of the largest uh, flavor and fragrance company, uh, they have presence in both flavors as well as fragrance. So it's 85, 15, 85 is fragrance and 15% in uh, flavor segment. The company got listed in 2015 and having a market share of around 10%. Uh, this is a third generation uh, of the SH Kilkar business family and all the family members are trained chemists. Uh, among the Indian listed uh, space, uh, SH Kilker has seen uh, more organic acquisitions in recent years, both in India as well as abroad. Privy is the largest uh, manufacturer and exporter of fragrance chemicals in India. Uh, they supply to large uh, F&F blenders and the end user industry like perfume manufacturers and FMCG. Uh, it is highly backward integrated to make aroma chemicals from CST technology and it is one of the four global companies and the only one in Asia uh, who is using the CST. So company has set up a refinery to separate the sulfate from the CST. Uh, it is a very capex intensive uh, steps which the company has taken a couple of years back but it has worked in their favor. Uh, they have seen less price volatility on the RM side. Uh, compared to the companies which are following the GTO route because uh, getting access to pine trees uh, both in terms of price and uh, timely getting uh, access is very difficult. What they do is uh, they have a tie up with the global pulp mills. So there are roughly around 180 pulp mills and they have a tie up with 45 companies which uh, is sufficient for them to meet their requirements. So they have a huge uh, runway in case they want to increase the requirement of uh, pulp uh, based. Just to uh, decrease their dependent on pine based chemistry, recently uh, they have launched few new products, uh, Camphor, uh, Galaxy Musk in recent years. So it is yet to see how this uh, product takes off. So this is the aroma chemical value chain. So the raw material sourcing could be uh, synthetically from petrochemicals or uh, naturally from pine tree, musk and others. So what Previ has done is, they have tried to stick to non-fossil side. Uh, so their uh, petrochemical based uh, chemistry is only 5% for phenol, rest 95% is non-fossil. Uh, out of this 70%, uh, their products are manufactured from pine trees. Uh, so the building blocks uh, for pine tree would be alpha penine, beta penine, longifolin, etc. Uh, globally, Aroma Chemicals is $5.5 billion and 37% of the products are manufactured from pine tree. But Previ uh, is getting revenue of 70% from pine tree chemistry. 
so that is the reason they want to decrease their dependency on pine tree and launch uh, these newer products of camphor galaxy musk and so on uh, if you see in the recent past uh, the pine tree contributions has come down from 76% to 67% jivodon uh, which is the largest player uh, they have signed a jv agreement with pv in 2021 to set up a greenfield facility uh, so pv has a 51% equity capital stake in this company and uh, the mandate is that pv will manufacture 40 products exclusively for jivodon for its high end products uh, out of 120 crores equity infusion of 40 crores and balance will be debt the facility is likely to commission this year and expected uh, asset turn could be between 1 to 1 1.5x so this is a big step where uh, the largest company has chosen pv as their jv partner uh, setting up a greenfield uh, capacity exclusively for their consumption these are few end products uh, for pv speciality so roughly 62 percent coming from p9 so this number would keep changing in some year it would be 65 could be 61 and so on but somewhere in the range of 60 to 70 percent uh, citral 11 percent uh, musk again it's a traditional product for them uh, the products like Galax Musk, Pryonel, Timber Touch contribute 16% of the revenue. Phenol, which is petrochemical based, uh, 8%, which they want to anyways reduce going forward. So, all three companies have done well in terms of uh, sales growth. Uh, OL, uh, which is Oriental Aromatics, have struggled a bit in last couple of years uh, because of their camphor segment. However, uh, recent trend has shown some price increase in the uh, camphor market. Uh, PV has consistently grown over the years and so has uh, SH Kilgar. Uh, in terms of gross margin, uh, PV has consistently grown uh, from 2016 at 25% to almost 45% now. Uh, SH Kilgar has remained in a band of 40 to 45% and uh, Oriental being the most uh, volatile. Similar is the trajectory for EBITDA margins, uh, Oriental being the most volatile. On the ROE end, uh, uh, in the recent years, uh, all companies are undergoing CAPEX. Uh, has done CAPEX of 800 crores. Uh, SS Kelker has been doing inorganic acquisition. So, this has led to uh, depressed ROEs. Uh, these are the uh, least ROE numbers these uh, companies have seen for last many years. Uh, so, these are impacted uh, temporary in nature because of the high capex. As we have seen with global companies also, so debt to equity is a common phenomena across this industry. And so is the case with uh, Indian companies. Uh, PV at uh, close to 1.0, uh, SH Kilker at 0.5, and uh, Oriental at 0.3. So, yeah. Uh, so, what are the growth? Uh, the companies uh, in this space are dependent on the end user industry. If the end user is doing well, they will have keep uh, they will keep growing uh, on their products and newer demands. Uh, Consumers' inclination to experiment as consumers seek different uh, fragrance, different products, uh, the demand will keep pouring in. Uh, the companies also need to expand their portfolio basket. The broader the offering, uh, it will help manufacturers better respond to the consumer demand for products that support uh, health and well being. Also, these chemical companies need to have uh, in depth understanding and staying ahead of the curve. As we saw, the order flow. Uh, process uh, the mandate will be giving will be given to the all manufacturer and the one who has uh, more understanding of the consumer preference will probably have a better advantage uh, in terms of raw material supply if the companies are backward integrated they will have an edge both in terms of raw material supply and pricing uh, regulatory uh, of course if you're present in europe uh, those are very stringent regulatory requirements so companies need to be very sound on uh, regulatory compliances. 
so these few slides are on the ingredients uh, these are the backward uh, in the value chain uh, so base ingredients are chemicals which are used uh, for manufacturing flavors and fragrance chemicals they are obtained uh, either from a feedstock using a synthetic process or from naturally occurring spices herbs fruits flavors when it comes to india uh, india is uh, in in terms of ingredients india is positioned very well uh, with availability of raw materials and rich legacy on the natural products uh, synthetic ingredient manufacturers have chosen very specific niche and molecule so uh, when we compare natural versus synthetic so india uh, is having an edge on the natural uh, ingredients uh, most of these ingredients are available uh, in india due to our uh, strong ayurveda and spices and herbs uh, india is a leading uh, producer of natural uh, base ingredients given the abundance of raw materials uh, it's an important supplier in the global market sizable global uh, spices demand in multiple Typical ingredients: mint, ginger, chili, chili pepper, pepper, uh, star, ginger, lemon grass. India ranks among top three producers in the world. Uh, on the synthetic side, uh, uh, close to fifty percent of the ingredients are derived from petrochemicals, which is again largely dominated by Middle East, and other thirty-five percent uh, pine tree. which is grown on the mountainous region with uh, availability of sand so uh, usa canada are more active on this space india lags heavily uh, as far as uh, ingredients market size is concerned uh, it has grown from 13.5 billion dollars in 2016 to 18 billion dollar this ingredients were also include uh, nutra suticals uh roughly around 50% would be going into nutraceuticals apart from flavors and fragrances so the industry has grown at a cgr of uh, 6% and as we saw uh, 50% uh, of this industry size is fragrance and value chain and 50% uh, nutraceutical consumers would naturally have inclination towards natural ingredients so the products which use Uh, natural ingredients are far more popular than the synthetic ones uh major f and f like givadon iff simrise they are uh, highly backward integrated so they will also try and make proprietary ingredients which are not widely available globally so over 70% of the ingredients market uh, is the production is done by either the top 10 uh, flavor and fragrance chemical manufacturer or there would be some pure play uh, ingredient companies some indian companies uh, operating in this space are uh, so most of these companies are unlisted except uh, avt natural that's the only listed company again a very small size company so a large number of this uh, natural based ingredient players are based out of kerala uh, given the proximity to the raw material source and rich history of ayurveda uh, in this part of india uh, the base ingredient space in india uh, have its own strength however it is subject to uh, competition and some degree of uh, pricing pressure uh, raw materials account for almost 70% of the final ingredients product uh, in terms of relationship with uh customers uh, customers set for base ingredients used for uh, f and f industries limited to major uh, global players uh, predominantly four players uh they have to depend uh, uh, on this top 10 players who dominate the global market almost 50% of the volume for this ingredient market comes from top four customers uh in terms of cost optimization and process efficiency india is the leading player of natural base ingredients globally due to the abundance of uh, raw materials so 60% of the supply is managed by three major players in kerala so uh, these are the peer valuation of uh, listed indian companies in the space uh, in terms of market cap uh, pv is the largest followed by 
as such kilkar oriental and so on uh, few companies which are active in uh, camphor market have struggled uh, which is reflected in the pet numbers uh, roes have been in double digit between 10 to 15% for almost all the players and the last column highlights the price earning ratios as of fi24 so uh, being a part of uh, chemical industry uh, these companies uh, will naturally be uh, exposed to uh, tightening regulations on environment as well as uh, safety uh, especially this segment which is a premium segment it has uh, experienced rapid change because of the end user applications uh, since companies are present globally they will have supply chain disruptions maybe due to war or what we saw on the red sea uh, so those challenges will have to be mitigated uh, since they are dependent uh, externally on the raw materials so any significant inflationary trends or pricing uncertainty will further lead to impact uh, forex fluctuation is uh, partly a natural hedge because they have significant uh, exports uh, also so uh, the, the industry is basically dependent on uh, lifestyle products because most of the usage of this chemicals are for uh, fragrance product which is predominantly a lifestyle product uh, they need to do a lot of capex or uh, do some acquisition in organic to uh, remain active or expand their product base uh, most of this uh, chemistries are complex so they need to invest highly uh, in the scientists to keep uh, innovating new chemistries uh, year and year uh, regulatory norms are something uh, they need to follow and of course uh, they need to incur a lot of cost uh, also uh, some of these product developments could take a very long period so uh, previ has uh, just uh, got uh, this biomethyl developed which took around 7 years for them to manufacture similarly a chinese company took almost 13 years to develop one uh, citral product so sometimes uh, Uh, the formulations could take a very very uh, long period also so this is a chart from jiwadon annual report of uh, cy 2023 uh, it basically depicts the free cash flow that the company has generated as well as the dividend uh, per share so since 2010 till 2023 uh, not a single year where they have seen negative free cash flows despite uh, being an industry which needs high r&d uh, high capex or some of the inorganic acquisitions uh, also the dividend per share has consistently increased for almost all of the 14 years uh, from 21.5 dividend per share to almost 68 uh, last year yeah thank you how how polluting are these industries do they pollute i mean is there is some by product is that happens are part of the product manufacturing yeah so uh, as previous said that they are trying to uh, go more and more into non fossil fuels that will save you from the uh, pollution regulatory norms or environmental hazards so most of these global companies have uh, if you see they have reduced uh, this risk since they have been hello since they have been trying to acquire more and more natural raw materials so uh, if your uh, product usage is more on the petrochemical side definitely yes the pollution will be on the higher side but the trend shows they have been investing more on the green chemistry any questions on zoom Okay since there are no more questions i think we can end the session okay hi uh, thanks for a very insightful and exhaustive presentation i think few things just i wanted to understand one i think seems like a very interesting space with respect to the trends that you mentioned but i'm failing to understand especially for the indian players 
I think why has one growth been only in single digits while I was just looking through Skinner? So it appears as if they've just grown in low teens or single digits over the last couple of years, despite the trends that we talked about. And second is, I mean, given the high capital intensity in the business, and at best, if you're making these kind of low teens proceeds, why are valuations at, sort, at such abnormally high levels? I mean, what explains that? And then what's your view in terms of, I mean, whether these are sustainable or are I mean, how do you look in terms of outlook for the industry given the way they have performed? Yeah, so, uh, uh, rather than commenting on individual companies, uh, so if you see these companies are very small, uh, not having great presence globally, especially in the premium markets of uh, Europe or North America. And also, uh, individually, if you see these companies are still evolving. Uh, even the largest player is still trying to develop new markets, uh, getting away from its legacy business of Penine. So a lot of evolutions are happening. One of the players is doing a lot of acquisitions uh, which have gone wrong for them because as we see, uh, this is not a very traditional industry. So there will be a lot of learnings, you know, for a country like India for which this segment are not very, very traditional. So this is probably a learning period where one will uh, succeed uh, uh, extremely high, but there could be some failures also in the medieval. But looking at the global trend like Jivardon, which is 250 years old company, it does shows you know we can maintain a good uh, top line good margins and roe so in terms of industry it is great uh, uh, why some companies are not much uh, doing great it's probably the learning days for them so industry remains rock solid thank you so much Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, so a lot of the specialty companies at times, they have their, you know, finished goods also. They sell it in the other markets for high margins also. Are the Indian players looking at it? Because we have some channel checks we did with the specialty chemical folks. So some of their finished goods, they go in for a higher margin as well. So is this possible in this industry? No, when you say finished goods, uh, so what they are doing is they are only selling chemicals and not the end user uh, industry products. Uh, let's say fragrance or a perfume. So as per my knowledge, uh, Indian companies are not doing it. Uh, even at the global level, uh, looking at their uh, annual report and the segmentation, I didn't found any sizable presence. If it is at a very small number, one or two percent, it could be, which may not be highlighted, but uh, my understanding suggests uh, they are only into pure B2B uh, side. And just one more last question. For the Indian companies, you had spoken about the original ones who make and the ones who copy. So just to give us a you know, a fair value out of 100%, what is the original aspect and the copy aspect of the Indian players, if you could give a number? Very difficult to give a number, but uh, global companies are the uh, innovators uh, uh, in the segment. Uh, Indian companies uh, have a long way to, you know, uh, develop that bandwidth, uh, that technology, uh, that R&D skills, so a uh, long way. Thank you. Hi. So, uh, I, I, if I'm not wrong, you said that Indian companies are not FDA approved. So, what is, what are the challenges and why they are not going for an FDA? Yeah, so, uh, Previ has one plant which is FDA approved. Uh, the other companies have not yet tapped that segment because uh, the FMCG segment where the food and beverage applications are wide, uh, fragrances for perfumes are a very wide industry. Probably those sector itself are not tapped by Indian companies. So, uh, in terms of preference, pharmaceutical could be you know uh, at the back end because of stringent regulations. But VV has one plant approved for USFDA. So we might see more uh, companies uh, going for that uh, at the later stage once they tap sizable these segments of FMCG and the uh, fragrance. So, so means despite this, they can sell it to the foreign company. Is it? Uh, to the peers, not the pharmaceutical products, other, but the other products. Thank you. Any other questions? I think, thank you for, uh, thank you Abhishek, thank you for such a wonderful session. Whenever things got rough, I always remember what my father used to say. 
running a business just as to man my son there are ups and downs glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated the character of a man and the character of a business are not very different are they yes but when the chips are down we must stand up dust ourselves off and more wrong volatility it's a funny thing it makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions sure you can question some of your decisions but stay steadfast on your goals dad always said there are no shortcuts and no quick profits there are no free lunches are there there is only one right way at ppfs we think like rahul and his father that volatility is a fact of running a business and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business we use value investing principles to manage your money this means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term ppfas mutual fund there's only one right way mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully